We are in this series called 2020, where we have been taking uh, different books of the Bible and taking a look at chapter 20, verse 20, and uh, there'll be no uh, death and destruction this week. I'm sorry to let you know. If you were here last week, uh, we heard a, an awesome message uh, on the book of Judges, an incredible book in the Bible, and I would encourage you, I hope you enjoyed that video that played before service last week. It's very informational, but I'd encourage you to go read the book for yourself. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. It's, it's very, very interesting. One of my favorite books of the Bible, which I don't know what that says about me, uh, probably that I'm a little twisted, but it's just an incredible book, and you see the path that God is starting to, to do to, uh, to eventually uh, get where, uh, where he wants to in, in the plan. And so make sure that you, you read that book. Today, we are going to jump into kind of the next book in the Bible. Uh, the book of Ruth is after Judges, but it's a short little book. I'd encourage you also to read that if you have some time, especially have, have daughters, granddaughters, have them read it. It's an incredible, incredible story. Uh, but we are jumping into a new book today, the, the following book. And it happens to be uh, my, probably my favorite book in the Bible, uh, it, which is why when we were divvying up this series, my dad said, do you, you want this one on Judges? And I read the story and I went, pass. Uh, you can have that one. I will take 1 Samuel. And so we are going to take a look at a story today. 1 Samuel, of course, is the book where we meet, find out, see the peaks and valleys of the life of David, who is my favorite uh, character in the Bible, other than Jesus. We always have to say that so we don't get in trouble. Uh, and this story that we're going to look at today is uh, not one that you maybe look at a ton when it comes to looking at the life of David. We're actually not even going to talk about David that much. We're going to take a look at a relationship that he had. And uh, you have to understand a little bit of, of the background of this story before we can kind of dig in. But before we do that, I'm just going to quickly give you the title of my message today, and this will give you a little insight into what and, what and who we're going to talk about. The title of my message today is, Show Me Your Friends, I'll Show You Your Future. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. We've all had parents say to us, you have all said to your kids, I don't like who you are becoming when you hang out with them. We have all had it said to us. I've had it said to me multiple times. I'm sure that some of my friends had it said to them about me multiple times, uh, which is a whole other story. It, it, you can see people as they begin to hang out with certain people or certain people groups that all of a sudden they begin to change. Their attitude begins to change. The way they talk, the places they go, the things that they listen to, watch, do, all of this stuff begins to change. Why? Because we're influenced by the people around us. And David had someone in his life that he was extremely close with and, and had a huge influence on him, and his name is Jonathan. And I believe that we can learn a lot from the story of David and Jonathan. We're not going to look at the whole thing, but just to give you a little bit of background about what's going on, right? We finished Judges, and then you can read Ruth, and then all of a sudden, the, the Israelite people, they, they want a king, and so Saul becomes their king, and then we know the story of Samuel goes to Jesse's house, and he's looking at all the God tells him to go. The future king is there. He doesn't see David. He calls David. He anoints David, and David goes, and he fights Goliath, and he kills Goliath, and all of a sudden, David becomes this cult hero, right? Everyone is obsessed with David, and Saul cares about David and, and, and brings David into his home, and David forms this relationship with Jonathan, who is Saul's son. They become best friends. I mean, they are besties, right? You can go read it for yourself in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel. It talks all about the relationship that David and Jonathan had. I mean, they were like brothers. It says they, they loved each other more than they loved themselves. That's how much they cared about one another. But all of a sudden, David begins to have success, and he begins to have more success and more success and more success. 
So much so that in chapter 18, it says that women in the streets, when they would come back from battle, would sing a song that would say, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his ten thousands. I don't know about you, but as a man, sometimes our pride can get the best of us. Sometimes it can creep in a little bit. Someone is trash talking us or we hear someone talking about how good someone, I, I'll admit to you, sometimes I live in the past a little bit. You know, I, 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 I help uh, coach a boys JV basketball team this year at the school that I went to, and sometimes I hear them talking about players that used to go there and, and, and how good this kid is or that kid is, and I'm not going to lie to you, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I would have crushed that kid when I was in high school, <laughs> right? Because because we, 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 there's just something, there's something inside of us, right? Like, I, I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan, and every single time one of these children talks about who someone else that's the goat, the, my blood begins to boil at a temperature that I can't explain to you, right? Because we, it's, this, it's this sense of pride. And so, so Saul all of a sudden starts hearing these things, and he starts welling up with pride and with anger, so much so that he, he throws a spear at David twice. I don't know what was up with David that after the first time he wasn't like, I'm good. Twice he throws a spear at David and Saul just has this, this anger within him that begins to well up and it says that, that, that God leaves him, that he, he's, he's so infuriated with David and all the success that David's had, that he actually begins to plot against David. But this is how cool David is and how blessed by God David is, is that Saul says, I'm, I'm gonna, David's going to marry my daughter, and I'll have, I'll have my daughter kind of talk to David, and, 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 we'll, and I'll know everything about David, and we'll betray David that way. But Saul's daughter falls in love with David. <laughs> And then he says, I'm going to put him in charge of, of, of all these, these armies, and he's going to be the commander, and I'll let the Philistines kill him. That way I don't have to worry about it. But David just keeps winning battle after battle after battle, and all it does is it makes Saul more and more mad, so much so that Saul orders David's death. But then Jonathan comes in, and he kind of talks Saul off the ledge, and he's like, listen, David, I love David, and David's done so much for us. And he, he talks his dad down a little bit. To where Saul comes, David comes back in, and he's playing his harp. David, he's a jack of all trades, you know. He's killing people on the weekends, playing the harp on the weekdays, you know. He's, got, he's, a, he's a cultural phenomenon, this David, right? I mean, he's just incredible. And he's, he's back playing his harp for King Saul and if the Bible says that Saul, again, as he's watching David play this harp that's supposed to calm him and give him peace, that this evil spirit comes over him, and he throws a spear at him again. Must not have been very good with a spear, or David was really fast. He throws a spear at him again and tries to kill him and says that David flees, runs off. And we come to chapter 19 and that's 18 19 we come to chapter 20 and David has a plan David comes to Jonathan and says your father wants to kill me and Jonathan's like no how he would never want to do that and David's like dude he threw a spear at me and Jonathan's like you got to be kidding me I can't believe this and so David comes up with this plan where he says there's a festival coming up and I'm supposed to sit next to to your father. I'm supposed to sit at the table. And he says, I'm not going to go to the festival. And if your dad notices that I'm not there and he says to you, where is David? Tell him that my father wanted me to come home and that I went home for the festival. And if he doesn't get mad, then, then we'll know that it's okay and that I can come back. But if he does get angry, then you'll know that he does want to kill me and I'll, I, have to, I have to flee from this place. And it says at that moment that Jonathan and David make a covenant with one another, so much so that it affects their ancestors all the way on down, this covenant that they make. I mean, these guys are, they're getting matching tattoos, right? They're like, they're getting the little necklaces with the heart, the broken heart on each side that connect together. I mean, they are best friends. They are brothers making this covenant with one another. And in chapter 
uh, 20 and verse 18, it says, Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon festival, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. When you have stayed for three days, you shall go down quickly and come to the place where you hid yourself on that eventful day when my father tried to kill you and shall stay by the stone Izel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I shot at a target. And I will send a boy saying, go find the arrows. If I specifically say to the boy, look, the arrows are on this side of you, get them. Then come back by my father's table, for it is safe for you and there is no danger as the Lord lives. But if I say to the boy, look, the arrows are behind you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. As for the agreement of which you and I have spoken, the covenant that they made, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever, making sure that we each keep our word. The story continues and the new moon festival arrives and on day two, Saul says nothing of David's absence on day one. And on day two, Saul mentions, where is the son of Jesse? He doesn't even call him by name. He says, where is the son of Jesse? And Jonathan then begins to tell his father that David has been called home and that he couldn't be here with us. And Saul is enraged, so much so that he begins to scream and yell and curse at Jonathan and freaks out on him. And so Jonathan runs out with this boy on the following day like they had planned. And he shoots these arrows at the target and tells the boy to run past. And the Bible says that after the boy has left, he goes and he meets David and they weep together. And that David runs off and flees for his life. And Jonathan is left to kind of go back and, and deal with this whole mess. And like we've been doing every week in this series, we've been taking a look at chapter 20, verse 20. And so it was already up there, but it simply says, I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I shot at a target. It's a simple verse. You could read it and say, ah, that doesn't really mean much. But when I read it and when I read the whole story, I thought to myself, man, good friends warn us when stuff's coming. Good friends have a plan to help us get through difficult times. And that's who Jonathan is in this moment. His own father wants to kill his best friend. And as much as he loves his father and as much as he honors his father, the bond that he has with David, the friendship that they have, a godly friendship that they have, is knitted and woven together with this covenant. And Jonathan says, man, I want to help you solve this. I want to help you get out of this. We have to understand that friends will always determine the quality and direction of our lives. Good and bad. Yeah. Right? We, we hear things like that and we go, well, yeah, the good friends, they definitely helped. No, the, the bad friends do so as well. Even more so, maybe, determine the directions of our lives. We have to be sure we know who we're allowing to come close to us and to affect our lives. Proverbs 13, 20, it says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. We, we need to be people that determine in our lives, man, I, I got to find some people around me that are wise, that are knowledgeable, that make good choices so that my life could be affected in the same way. Proverbs 12, 26, it says, The righteous Choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. If we want to be righteous people, we want to be people who honor God in everything that we do, we need to choose our friends, not just flippantly or not just, oh, we got a couple things in common or, oh, we, we this or that. Carefully inspecting, uh, understanding what, 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 what's the ultimate goal here in this friendship, in this relationship. Before we dig in a little bit, I just, there's a verse in Proverbs that I would call friendship defined, right? We, the, the, the idea of friendship defined in this one passage. In Proverbs 17, it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. A friend loves at all times. There are some of us, we all know it. We've had friends that the minute we've told them, Man, I'm going to I'm gonna start going to church, and I'm going to start praying, and I'm just, God's really changed my life. All of a sudden, what happens? They start to 
drift away, drift away. Or we're going through a difficult time. And, Man, I could really use someone right now, but you know, they're too busy. Or they don't have to. A true friend, a real friend, a godly friend loves at all times. I found this other version of the Bible this week. It's weird. It's called the Facebook version. Re- this is what Proverbs 17 says in the Facebook version. A friend is someone you may or may not know well who accepts your friend request on Facebook. This person is born to like and comment on all your posts to make you feel good about yourself. It's a crazy version. I don't, I don't know where it came from. This is the culture that we live in nowadays where we feel like we have friends because that's what they're called on social media. We feel like we're a leader because we have followers on social media. We, we used to give my dad a hard time because when he first got Facebook, he, uh, he was real pumped about the friend stuff. He, he was real, real pumped. Me and Jason are really his only friends, and so he was like <laughs> super excited when, when he'd get, he'd be like, I'm up to 1,100, I'm up to 1,400, and then he'd come in one day, he's like, I lost six friends last night, and we're like, yeah, did you hear what you said on Sunday, you know, but he's like, he's, he's calculating them, you know, and we're like, dad, you gotta, you gotta let it go, man, you gotta let it go, like, they're, they're not real, like, they're not real friends, but that's how we get sometimes, we get caught up in the hype, and we get caught up in the idea of what culture says is cool or popular or the friends that we have. And the American Sociological Review says that average American, an average American has only two close friends and 25% have none. That's a, that's a crazy number. 25% have none and the average American has two. We, we need to be people that understand the value of friendship but also the friendships that we have to understand, man, how do, how do I balance this? How do I make sure that this is something that is benefiting me and that I'm beneficial to the people around me? Why are friendships declining? Why do I feel and why does this, this uh, review say that friendships are declining? Three quick reasons. One, increasing work hours. You have no time to build relationships because everybody's just worried about what they can get, what they can achieve, how high the ladder they can climb. And so we don't have time to build the relationships like we should. The second thing is rising divorce rates. The study said something, something, it was some crazy number. I can't remember it off the top of my head. I should have wrote it down. It was like 60 or 70% of couples who are friends with another couple, if that couple gets divorced, that they're like 60 or 70% likely to not be friends with either person because they don't want to offend or anything like that. And you know how high the divorce rate is. And so it's beginning to decrease friendships and relationships. The third thing is the explosion of social media that we appreciate followers more than we do actual friends. We actually go out. I see people. We actually go out to dinner with our friends. And while we're with our human friends, we are looking at our digital friends. Did you see what this person said? Did you see this? Did you see how many likes I got? Did you see how many... It's a warped thing. But when you really think about it, this is where we're at. We need to value our friendships It's impossible to live right when you have the wrong friends. It's impossible to be the person that God wants you to be when you have the wrong people around you. If you're struggling to stay on track with God, you're like, man, I'm trying to get to church. I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to remind. I would encourage you, take a look at your support group. Take a look at your friends. Take a look at the people that you have allowed to be close with you and see how are they influencing me, how Are they affecting me? 1 Corinthians 15 says, Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. We want to be people of good character. We want to be people of righteousness. We want to be people who follow Christ with everything that we have. And we have to look out for the people that we allow into our friendship circle. So, three types of friends that everybody needs. Hopefully, most of you have these and you're like, piece of cake. I got all these friends already. Three types of friends that everyone needs. The first is a friend who makes you better. A friend that makes you better. Jonathan made David a better person. You read the life of David and the story of David and you will continually see a reoccurring theme of Jonathan coming into David's life and encouraging him. 
just making him a better person. You need people around you who will make you better, not only spiritually, but in life. People who say, I'll go to the gym with you. I don't want to go to the gym with you, but I'll go to the gym with you. Can we wait till January is over and everybody's gone? People who will, will, will help you, teach you about life, lead you and help you and guide you, direct you, whether it's financially or spiritually or mentally or physically, whatever it is, that they come alongside you and they make you a better person. Proverbs 27, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. We need to get people in our life who build us up and get rid of the ones that we've had to carry around. We go through life sometimes saying, yeah, it's my best friend right here. He's my best friend, <laughs> you know, and we're, 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 we're almost falling over. We're bent completely over because we're carrying our friends around. And God's like, it, it, it's not intended to be that way. We're supposed to walk side by side and lift each other up, build each other up, help each other through tough experiences and through life. That, that's what we're called to do as Christians, and that's what we need to allow into our life. C.S. Lewis said, the next best thing to being wise oneself is to live in a circle of those who are. Yeah. I'm not the smartest person in the world, I will admit to you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I never really got good grades. I didn't pay attention much in school. If you're a kid in here, don't listen to this. Uh, and if you're a parent, don't get mad. But I, I, didn't, I didn't really focus. I didn't really pay attention the way I should. I did enough to get by, right? which is not a great thing, but I'm here, so, you know, I mean, <laughs> C's get degrees, you know, that's what I was taught at a young age, but, I mean, I've said it before, you go to the doctor's office, all that's up on the wall is their diploma, not their report card, <laughs> so you don't really know, you're like, I don't understand why I never get healed when I go to the doctor, yeah, because your doctor got C's in med school, <laughs> that's it said it before. It's the truth. Now you're thinking about it. You're like, oh, next time I go, I think I am going to ask for what their GPA was, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not, I'm not the, I, there are some things that my mind really gravitates to and I have a lot of knowledge about. And then there are other things where I just, if I was never interested in it, I just kind of was like, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll figure it out type of thing. But the best thing to do, you remember, the best thing to do when you're in high school, you're not good at history. Hang out with the kids who are good at history. Maybe they'll help you. Maybe they'll let you copy their homework. You never know. <laughs> but you, you, if, you're, if, you, if there's something in life and you're like, man, I'm really, I'm struggling in this area. Like my finances are never right. Or, or my, my relationship is just always in, in turmoil. Or, or I, I struggle with this. Or I struggle with that. Get around some people who are good at the thing that you struggle with. But a lot of times pride comes into our life and we say, well, I don't want to put myself out there. I don't, I don't want them to know that I struggle with this. You're never going to get any better at it. The hardest thing ever is saying, I need help. But once we do that, once we get through that barrier, all of a sudden we can begin to build on who we are and build on our own lives. But we got to surround ourselves with some people who can help us get better. The second type of friend that we need is a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. Find some Christian friends. There are so many of us who come in and out of this church every week, and we come to church and we worship and we praise God, and all week long we hang out with sinners. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't hang out with sinners. I think Jesus hung out with sinners, but I think that Jesus' closest friends weren't sinners. And a lot of times in our culture, we get that twisted. We allow things to come into the church, and we allow things to become acceptable because we say, well, Jesus', said, Jesus closest friends were people who were following him. We need to understand, man, I need people around me. My closest friends need to be people who are following Jesus who can build me up spiritually. You read on in the story of David and Jonathan in, ver in chapter 23, while David is now really running for his life from Saul. It says, while David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, 
he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. That's a friend. My dad is trying to kill you. Can you, I mean, think about this. This is like a Jerry Springer episode. Like, my dad is trying to kill you. But I'm going to sneak off and I'm going to find you in the cave, in the desert, wherever you are. And I'm not going to sit there and go, hey, listen, man, like, maybe you should turn yourself in. Like, you know, my dad's going to find you and, like, he's going to kill you. You know, no, he finds David. And what does he do? He lifts him up spiritually. He gives him spiritual strength. He says, David, God's going to get you through. God has a plan for your life. You're the anointed one. You're the future king. God has a plan. You defeated Goliath. You can defeat this. You can... That's what spiritual friends do, and we wonder sometimes when we go through difficult things in life, and we feel like, God, I'm just praying to you, but I don't feel any strength at all, and we don't have any people in our support group that are coming to us and saying, man, God's with you. God can help you. God can strengthen you. All our friends are saying, did you watch Dr. Phil yesterday? Did you read that book? Did you go to therapy? And we're like, none of that is helping. Yeah, it's not helping because we don't have people that will come alongside us and say, God will lift you up. God will help you. I'll pray with you. I'll go to church with you. Let's read our Bibles together. Those are the types of friends that last. Those are the types of friends that help us grow spiritually in who we are. Those are the type of friends that we need to find in our lives. The third type of friend is a friend who will tell you the truth. This is the hardest one because we don't want to hear the truth which is why our culture has gravitated to social media. Why? Because no one tells you the truth on social media. You could post the ugliest pic. Go home today and post the ugliest picture of yourself that you could find. One of your friends would be like, girl, you look so good. You're like, that is the ugliest picture I have ever put. You got like four chins. Like, that, that is the ugliest picture. But that's what social media is. It's just a place where we can go and feel better about ourselves. We can get uplifted. I get it on Twitter, everyone's a hater and stuff like that, but nobody ever puts a face to it. Everybody's just hating on everybody there. But on Instagram, on Facebook, no, nobody's going on. You don't put a selfie on and someone goes on your Facebook and is like, rough week? Like, no one does that. <laughs> nobody does that, right? Like, the, they click the thumbs down. Like, no, no one dislike. No one does that. And so that's the culture that we've bred now. We have, have kids and teenagers and, and young adults that... They don't have any friends except for the friends they have on social media. Why? Because it makes them feel good about themselves. Sometimes we need people to come along that will tell us the truth. Hey, your life's messed up. You need help. But God can help you. Yeah. I can help you. Hey, you did this wrong. Hey, the way you spoke to your wife. Hey, the way you treat your kids. Hey, the way. Can I just love you for a minute? Can I just tell you? You need help. I'm here to help you. Proverbs 27, it says, An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from, a, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. We, listen, we got a lot of people in our lives that come around us and... They, they want to come alongside us and they want to tell us that we look pretty and that we're doing great and that life's awesome and that it's all going to be okay. We got to find some friends that look in our lives and say, it's not going to be okay if you keep doing what you're doing. You need to change. You need to fix some things in your life. We need people who will come alongside us, who will tell us the truth. Listen, some of you have lost friends and some of you have left friends. You said, I don't want anything to do with them anymore because they told you the truth. You said, what do you think about this? And they said, listen, honestly, I love you. This is what I think. And you were like, you're not a friend. And then two, three, four months later, all of a sudden, that thing crumbled. And you look back and you go, you know what? They were right. They were trying to help me. And you push them away because of it. We need to be people that find some friends around us who will tell us the truth. Uh, Plut Plutarch, Plutarch, this, he's an old philosopher, right? He said this. I saw it and I loved it. He said, I don't need a friend who changes when I change and who nods when I nod. My shadow does that much better. 
I thought it was good. Because yeah. we do. That, that's, we, we, don't, we don't need people in our, we don't need more yes men in our lives. We, that's what we have social media for. We don't need more people to tell us we're great and awesome. It's, it's, we do something great. We want people to come alongside us and tell us we did great. But we need people in our life who will come alongside us and who will correct us and fix us and shape us. And if you played sports at all growing up, as I did, you know after, after a great game, it could be the best game that you played all year. But if you have a good coach, he'll come in, she'll come in, and they'll tell you what you did wrong. You might have had a game where you did two things wrong, but they'll find the two things if they're a good coach. And it's frustrating as anything, but you know that they're only trying to make you better. And sometimes we need to find friends that will look at our lives, and even when we're doing awesome and we're doing great, they'll look and say, you might want to adjust that, you might want to fix that. And we need to be humble enough to accept that and to take it and watch as God begins to open that relationship. So the three types of friends every person needs. Quickly, the two types of friends every person doesn't need. Two types of friends every person doesn't need. The first one is a friend who distracts me from God's plan. You need to be careful, for the, for, careful of the friends who will constantly try to distract you from what God wants to do. They might not even be doing it on purpose, but if you have friends who don't know God the way that you know God, all of a sudden what will happen is they aren't going to prioritize the things that you prioritize. It doesn't mean that they're, you know, of the devil and they're filled with demons and they're tripping me up. God help me, they're tripping me. No, it's just you pick the wrong friends. That's all. And you need to figure out who are the people in my life that are distracting me from God's plan. Matthew 16 Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Poor Peter, man. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus himself saying it to one of his closest friends, get behind me. I'm not one for awkward moments. I don't mind them too much, but, you know, it's especially confrontation if Growing up with who I grew up with, confrontation is just a part of my life because uh, some people are more comfortable with it than others. Uh, and, and so I've been in some situations where there's some confrontation. And listen, it's awkward. It's awkward, right? You're like, oh, yeah, like, this ceiling is great. You know, they're just over here kind of doing their thing. You know, and you, can you imagine the rest of the disciples at this moment? Can you imagine Peter? He's like, did he just call me Satan? Like, are you, are you kidding? He's like, yeah, James, did you hear that? He just called him Satan. Like, that is crazy. But Jesus understood the value of friendship, and he understood the value of doing God's plan. And when someone came into his life that was trying to take him off the path, he said, no, get behind me. I, I don't have time for that. I'm on the move to, to achieve what God has for me. And if you're going to be in the way of that, I'm not going to do it rudely. I'm not going to tell you to go to hell or push you aside. But you need to get behind me because I'm on my way and you're in the way, right? Mark Twain said, keep away from those who try to belittle your ambitions. Small people always do that. But the really great make you believe that they too can become great. You need to find some people around you that say, man, I know that you can achieve this. I know that you can do this. And we need to get rid of the friends who distract us from God's plan. The second type of friend we don't need is a friend who continually tempts me to sin. The friend who continually tempts me to sin. If we have, you got a friend in your life that continually keeps asking you to go here, go there, do this, watch this, listen to this, and you know through your conscience, through the Holy Spirit speaking to you, you know, I shouldn't be going there. I shouldn't be doing this. I've been trying to quit this. I've been trying to let this go. God doesn't want me here. God doesn't want me doing this. And you know that, but you continually have a friend who tries to bring you into that with them. Why? Because misery loves company. We know that. So if somebody's going off to party or somebody's going off to do this or do that, they want someone to come with them. I've had a rough week. Come out with me. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. We have to be aware of the people who come into our lives and try to influence us in this way. James 1 said, says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
You have to understand that when your friend says, hey, let's go to the club tonight, let's get crazy, that is not God tempting you. You're like, God, is this a test? Should I go? Maybe I could witness to someone in there. No, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen like that. It is your friend tempting you. It is a test, a test that we fail far too often because we say, oh, I'll just go for a little bit, or oh, it's no big deal, or I'll just have one, or we'll do this or that. And we fail the test far too often. We need to be people that understand I have to allow the people around me to uplift me, to bring me closer to God, to give me spiritual strength, to make me better, not make me worse with them. Maybe you could come alongside that person and say, no, I don't want to go, but why not you come over, we'll watch a movie, and, and we can meet up in the morning, we'll have breakfast, we'll go to church. Maybe you can be that person of influence, but we have to be cautious of the people around us who continually tempt us to sin. Friendship is a hard thing. It's an awkward thing. It's a weird thing. It's hard sometimes to make new friends, especially for guys, right? You don't see a guy, he's kind of cool, has some things in common. You're not like, hey, you want to hang out sometime? It's weird, right? It's weird. <laughs> Girls are so, women are so good at that, right? They'll go to some book club or mom's thing, and this is, they're like, oh, my gosh, yeah, yeah. Oh, do you want to get coffee? Yeah, let's get coffee. And it's like, boom, best friends. <laughs> guys are like, what's up? <laughs> you know, that's it. <laughs> like, up when in their head they're like oh those shoes are awesome like but I can't tell them that you know like it's just it's hard it's hard friendship is a difficult thing and it I, I I truly listen all the scripture that I just read to you and there's hundreds more there's a ton of scripture about friendship for a reason God knew it was going to be hard for us because we want to be popular and we want to fit in and we want people to like us in our human nature but our spiritual selves, the Holy Spirit working in and through us, when we've truly committed our lives to God, we have to be people that are able to decipher our friends and able to figure out who is for me, who's against me, who's lifting me up, who's bringing me down. Are there any people in my circle of influence that believe what I believe? Are there, is there anyone that can help uplift me when it comes to the difficult times of life and I need someone to come alongside me and pray with me or strengthen me or ask me to go to church with them or listen to some worship music, whatever. Friendship's hard, it's difficult, but I pray that you would give an analysis of the friends in your life. I'm not telling you to call everybody today and say, hey, we can't be friends anymore. <laughs> but I think that you should look deep into the influence some of your friends have on you and the influence that you have on them. And I think that as we begin to examine that, all of a sudden, God will begin to illuminate and open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to see, maybe I need to change some stuff in my life. Charles Spurgeon, my guy. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said this about friendship. As we love any, let us try to preserve them from sin. Let us endeavor to warn them when temptation is near that they may not fall by the hand of the enemy. Yeah. Jonathan was this type of friend. Right. He said, listen, my father wants to kill you, and you've done nothing wrong, but this is what I'm going to do. If you're really in trouble, I'll let you know. I'll shoot some arrows to the side, and if, 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 if my, my servant goes against it, you'll know you're in trouble, and, and, and you can run, and, and I know you're going to have to run, but, but I'll come find you, and I'll encourage you, and I'll strengthen you spiritually. And it'll all be okay because I love you like a brother. And I love you the way that God loves us. Those are the types of friends that we need. Friends that will come alongside us, will help guide and lead and direct, direct us on this difficult path called life. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for friendships. I thank you for godly friendships. I thank you for the friends that I have, for the people that I have in my life who, who influence me in a good way, God. And I, I pray that you'd help each and every person in here, those watching online, God, who, who are going to go from here and take an inventory of their friends and the relationships that they have. I ask that you would help them to prayerfully consider, God, who is uplifting them and who is bringing them down, who is helping them grow closer to you and who is pulling them farther apart. I ask that you'd strengthen us in this. It's not an easy thing. It's, it's a hard task to do. But I ask that you'd strengthen us in it. Give us courage. God, to, uh, to make some cuts if we have to make some cuts. <laughs> Strengthen us today, God. 
We thank you for all that you're doing, all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.